invite you to come to the Capital Connection. We have a great time. In fact, what you saw in the video there was some very interesting things. You saw us inside the Capitol. See, we didn't want to just do a rally. There's, rallies are fine. There's nothing for, there's no problems with rallies. But, <clears throat> you know, we just didn't want to step on, on uh, stand on the steps and uh, basically uh, rah, rah, and then go back home. We wanted to get into the Capitol and pray for our elected officials in the Capitol. Well, they gave us the Congressional Auditorium. It seats over 500 people. We filled it up to standing room only. And then we started inviting people to come. Well, the chair of the Republican Party came. That was the lady that was speaking right at the end there, Kathy McMorse Rogers, a graduate of actually Pensacola Christian College, who was called into government and to the law by listening to De Dr. David Gibbs speak. In fact, one particular year, uh, she said, you know, I, I uh, surrender to preach. <clears throat> Excuse me. She said, I, I surrender to government from the David Gibbs preaching. She, she didn't surrender to preach, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, uh, just to make sure everyone <clears throat> understands that, and if anyone listens to this tape, okay, <clears throat> I'm just a little delirious. But in any case, uh, no, she uh, she surrendered to the law and to government uh, by listening to Dr. David Gibbs preach, and uh, she walked down the aisle as a high school student, and uh, and said what I did was I thought I was going to be working uh, with a CLA, and she said so I got my law degree, and they weren't hiring. And so she said, so I went ahead and, and uh, I just started to, uh, to look around and she said, I started running for uh, state offices and then uh, the U.S. Uh, Congress and, and actually sh right now she's fourth in line. That means she's the most powerful woman in the House of Representatives. She's the most powerful woman actually in Washington, D.C. So she's fourth in line. Amen. And just a, a gracious Christian lady. And, and uh, in fact, when she was telling that story uh, when, when year, uh, the next year, I said, well, Dr. David Gibbs is here. Oh, Dr. Harding, where is he? I said, he said, he's right there in the front row. She walked over and uh, she started weeping uh, by talking to him and letting him know that it was him uh, that influenced her to get into government. And then went over and addressed the pastors and again started weeping. And, and uh, she said, 26 years ago, I, I did, and I told you what she did when Brother Gibbs was, was speaking. And she was weeping. I looked at Brother Gibbs. He was weeping. And then I looked at the pastors, and many of the pastors were weeping as well. Amen. And so you come. We have an after-hours tour where we can actually go uh, into the Capitol. And actually, on the table back there, there's also some cards for the Capitol Connection for the next generation, 15 to 19-year-olds in September. Uh, that can come and do the same thing that the pastors and people do in March. But after hours, we go actually into the capital and we sing under the rotunda. We, we kind of have a church service. We were a little rushed that last time because uh, the, uh, the fellas had gotten in late because this, uh, of the snowstorms in different parts of our country. But normally we take a little more time and we went right down to the House Representatives and sat where those people sit. And then afterwards prayed, got up and turned around and bowed and prayed those people that were going to sit there the next day. We almost had uh, 400 people. The first year, <clears throat> uh, I went and asked a secretary that we're very good friends with. I said, I'd like to do an after-hours tour. Would the congressman uh, be willing to do that? She said, how many would you like to lead onto the Capitol after hours? It's about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. I said, 125. She said, Brother Harding, that's never been done. I said, well, check with the sergeant of arms. Maybe he'll let us do it. She came back and said, I don't believe it. He's going to let you do that. That's unprecedented, that many people. So the next year, she said, well, how many would you like to lead on the tour this year? I said, 275. She said, oh, Dr. Harding, that's never been done. I said, well, ask the sergeant of arms. Maybe he'll let us do that. She came back and she said, I don't believe he's going to let you do that. The third year, she said, how many this year? I said, 335. She said, okay. <laughs> and so it's grown since then and, and uh, now uh, 400 plus. And uh, we just have a great time. We have a wonderful time right in the Capitol there. And so... Uh, Hey, I've, I've had a good time here with you folks today. And, uh, boy, I flew in yesterday, and, and uh, Brother Chucky and Angie took me out to barbecue. It was good. What was the name of that place? Mutt's. Mutt's Barbecue. Oh, I ate, and then I, and then I ate, and, and I came real close to that, stepping over that line of gluttony, you know, real close, Okay. I didn't quite get over it, but boy, I tell you, I wasn't hungry for, for the evening, and, 
and uh, Brother Cox, uh, Miss Cox took us out to uh, Silver Bay today. We had fish there, and uh, it was wonderful, fish and, and uh, fried onions, amen. And so I've had a great time of fellowship. I've had a good time getting to know your pastor a little bit better and, and his wife, and, and uh, it's a blessing. You have a good pastor that has a good heart. I can see, I can see a pastor's heart real quick. It's reflected in the people. Amen. And so, you know, hey, folks, this is an amazing thing that you're getting right in on the ground floor of. And so just wait to see what God is going to do here. He's going to do some miraculous things right here in this church through your pastor and you folks here. And so I'm just excited. I'm excited for you. I want you to know this, that when I leave tonight, I'm going to put your pastor's name on my daily prayer list. And I'm going to start praying for your pastor and this work every single day. I pray for over 260 pastors by name every single day. And God's just laid that upon my heart. And your pastor is going to be another one that I'm going to add to that list. I pray for hundreds of missionaries every day. You say, Brother Harding, why do you do that? <clears throat> because God's just led me to do that. And folks, we need to be people of prayer. Amen. And I'm going to be talking about uh, how we can, through prayer, really affect our nation. Uh, the accommodations have been great. I, I slept like a baby last night, cried all night, sucked my thumb. and, and uh, But, uh, hey, woke up just uh, really refreshed. And uh, so thank you for the comfortable accommodations for the goodie basket. Amen. Uh, I'm like Brother Gibbs. I like a fruit basket with no fruit. Amen. Just all goodies and cookies and, you know, and so that was a blessing. And it's a blessing to see the trips here. Uh, man, I'm, I'm telling you, they're dear friends of mine, and, uh, and, and they're girls, and I told the girls, I know your granddad. He used to play racquetball with your grandpa, and they went, really? I said, yes, that's right, and he used to beat the snot out of me, amen? Uh, but it's great to see the, the trips, and what a blessing to, to, to be here tonight. Uh, take your Bibles, go with me this evening to Isaiah chapter 1, sure did enjoy uh, Sister Wendy and, and her presentation, and and it's a wonderful thing to be praying for a lady like this that is reaching those people that are hurting. Amen. There's a lot of hurting people out there. Amen. And when I go, wherever I go, I'm smiling at people all the time. Amen. And, and pastors from decades ago used to say this, hey, when you go out into the world, smile at people because everyone's having a rough time. And so I'll smile at people and sometimes I'll even wave at people. And, and I mean, people driving by and I'll go... And then they'll go, <clears throat> who was that? I have no idea. Yeah, but uh, I, I just, I like to do that. I like to talk to people, I like to learn people's names. I always get good service at restaurants because I learn the people's names and, and, and talk to the people. And, and I always get great service at restaurants. Then I, many times I'll ask for the manager and, and just brag on, on that uh, waiter or waitress. Amen. It's a good thing. I mean, we, we're God's people. Amen. And we need to be sharing this type of love for one another. God is love, amen, but he's also truth, and we need to have that balance uh, between speaking the truth in love, amen, and so uh, uh, look at Isaiah chapter 1, and, and I think this, I think we need to understand that America has been that gentle, that kind nation, that Christian nation uh, down through the decades, and how we have literally influenced the entire world. To be a kinder and friendlier place. If it wasn't for America, uh, I shudder to think what this world would be like. But now, for several decades, because we Christians have not really been involved in our government, now for the last several decades, we, we have kind of laid out, you see, from our God-given responsibility. And because of that, the world is starting to look at America much differently. It's because of us disregarding our responsibility that the Supreme Court, seven out of nine people decided how 60 million of our citizens were going to die. And I'm telling you, folks, that's very egregious. I, I was asked a question. Uh, Brother Harding, you said that God doesn't pardon the shedding of innocent blood. He doesn't. I'm talking about nations. He doesn't pardon any nation for the shedding of innocent blood. He pardons us for anything. But as far as a nation goes, God says... I will not pardon the shedding of innocent blood. He says, in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. So we need to ask mercy from God for the fact that we have seen over 60 million of our citizens 
literally tortured to death. And I'm sorry to say, a mother's womb sometimes in America is more dangerous than the inner urban streets. And that is something that we need to uh, look at and see what we can do to correct. I'm very thankful that this particular administration has said some amazing things here that I'm going to be going through in just a minute. There's uh, still several books out there, and I, I have had some people ask about the books. And, and uh, so every single book out there has the plan of salvation in the last chapter. So if you want to buy something for someone that, that might be hard, and that, yet they like history, that would be a good thing to get for them especially the maxims of George Washington, because it says basically in that book the last words that he ever spoke on this earth before he died. And how he said, I, I, I die hard, but I'm ready. And how he thanked his doctor and the other people that were in attendance to him and, and, and kind of sat up in bed and, and straightened himself and folded his hands and went to heaven. An amazing man. Uh, the father of our country, as many people have said and and what we need to do is we need to look back and realize some things and and understand that there's no substitute for experience amen there's no substitute so the young men need to be talking to the older men the young women to the older women to get some experience and and go to the gray heads you might say amen and some of our hair turns gray and some of it turns loose amen fellas i'm looking right over here amen but those heads are perfect that's why god wants to show them off amen and so but in any case hey you know the fact is i, I heard a story of this farmer and and he was a very vibrant older man he he, uh, he had retired from farming and and he said you know i I healed a lot of animals. I bet you I could heal people. And so he moved into town and, and got a little office and put up a shingle. And, and it said this, cures, $500. If you're not cured, I'll give you $1,000. we will call him, let's say, Dr. Geezer. But there was an actual doctor in town, and, and we'll call him Dr. Young. And Dr. Young was rather incensed that this farmer came into town and pretending to be a doctor. And so he said, I'm going to go teach this guy a lesson. And I'm going to make $1,000 at the same time. And so he walked in, and, and of course, small town, so everyone knew one another. And, and Dr. Geezer said, Dr. Young, oh, what seems to be the trouble? He said, well, I, I, I have a problem. He said, well, please get on the examination table. And so the nurse uh, that, that he had hired, quote, unquote, nurse, uh, came in, and uh, he he said, what seems to be the trouble? He said, well, I have no feeling in my mouth. I have no sensation, no taste whatsoever in my mouth. And he looked at his mouth. He said, nurse, I'll go and get the medicine from box 22 and put three drops on Dr. Young's tongue, which she did. By the time the third drop touched his tongue, he went, Dr. Young went, no, yeah, that's gasoline. He said, congratulations. <laughs> you got your feeling back. That'll be $500. <laughs> well, now Dr. Young walks out. And he's really angry. He says, I got to go get my $500 back, and I got to outsmart this guy at his own game. And so he thought for a little bit, and a, a few days later, walked back in and said, Dr. Young, I'm back already. He said, Dr. Geezer, I have another trouble. I have problems. He said, what, he said, what seems to be the trouble? Please sit on the examination table. He said, what, what seems to be the trouble? He said, I don't have any short-term memory. I can't remember what's happened just three, four days ago. He said, really? He said, a nurse, well, go get that medicine from box 22 and put three drops of that on Dr. Young's tongue. He said, no, you don't. That's gasoline. He said, congratulations, you got your memory back. <laughs> That'll be $500. <laughs> so now he walks out. He's out $1,000. Now what's he going to do? He says, I've got to think of a fail-safe plan this time and get at least my $1,000 back. So another week goes by, and he's thinking and thinking. Finally, he's got it. I got it. He walks in this time with a cane, and he's tapping around, and, and, uh, and Dr. Geezer sees him. He says, Dr. Young, please come in. What seems to be the trouble? He said, I've lost my eyesight. I can't see anything. I've lost my eyesight. He said, please, nurse, help him onto the examination table. And he goes over and sits on the examination table. He says, open up. Let me see your eyes. He looks at He said, you know, I don't think I can do anything for you. Here's your thousand dollars. He says, "Hey, that's only ten one dollar bills." He said, "Congratulations! <laughs> you got five hundred dollars." Now, 
Now, what, now what I'm saying is, we need to look past to the past to understand why we are where we are in the present. And from looking at the past, understand how we can proceed wisely into the future. I, I want to speak for just a little bit tonight on what I have entitled America's National Alzheimer's Disease. And Isaiah chapter 1, if you would please. It says this in chapter 1 and verse 1, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. A oh, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. Now I want you to mark these next two phrases here. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. And that's a very vulnerable spot to be in. And that's where America is tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Now we thank you again for loving us and we thank you once again for thy word and oh God, the eternality of your word, Father, the immutability of thy word. We thank you so much, dear God, that it is already forever settled in heaven that we hold in our hands something eternal. And Lord, there's only two things that are going to get out of this world intact, our eternal soul and the Bible in which we hold in our hands tonight. And so, dear God, we ask that you would go before us in everything that's said and done. Lord, help us to be mindful from whence we came. Help us, Lord, to have a circumspect walk. Dear God, through and by thy Holy Spirit and that sweet unction that only he brings, might you once again enlarge and enlighten our understanding. And as I step back, Lord, we ask that you would step forward. And dear God, that you would use uh, this sinner saved by grace as your vessel tonight. And Lord, that your words and thoughts might be my words and thoughts. And dear God, engraft them into our mind, our hearts, our souls. Father, help us, Lord, to realize that we can do something for the eternal cause of Christ by keeping our nation maintained and going forward for liberty's sake. Lord, we ask this in the precious name of your Son and our Savior, and by the power and the merit and the authority that is in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So in thinking of America tonight as we are, I think it's only fitting that we think about the only other nation, as I said this morning, that started from the truth of God's Word. And that, of course, is Israel. An amazing nation. You might say they had the same motto that we have in God we trust. And they, if, if they were right with God... Every time they went up against, no matter what type of foe, no matter how insurmountable that foe was, they beat back every foe, and they won the victory. Why? Because God fought for them. You understand, we shouldn't have won the war for independence. You understand that, right? You understand there's no reason why we won the war for independence aside from God. How on earth can you win a war where you lose more battles than you win? I'll tell you how. By God showing up. That's how. And time and time again, he showed up in miraculous ways. Time and time again, this war for independence was over. And then God changed everything. You see, it makes no difference what the score is. It makes no difference what inning it is. When God shows up, something miraculous happens. Amen. He divinely intervened for us. And the reason why is because we were prayerfully interceding for him to come. And Israel so blessed by God began to do exactly what the Lord said in this scripture 
the whole head is sick, as it says there in verse 5, and the whole heart faint. You see, there was a downward digression in any nation or individual or corporate entity, and that is this, people, nations, or corporations, or entities like a church, a corporate body of believers. Many times things happen where they start forgetting who God is. The whole head is sick. Then they start forsaking God with their hearts. And then they start following false gods with their life. Christians don't fall off the cliff overnight. They start forgetting who God is. They start forsaking God. And then they start following false gods. And then they go into ruination. Christians, nations, Entities all fall through this same type of thing. You see, mankind's always had a hard time grasping the fact that history is his story. It's God's interaction to man and man's reaction back to God. Many times what we see is it's cyclic. It goes round and around. What has been is going to come again. And, and uh, it serves as a reminder, a guidepost, uh, individually, nationally, memorializing events to remind us what God has done. Uh, one of our presidents said, we're doing a futile thing if we do not know from whence we came and what we've been all about. And so when you see here, God saying something to Israel, he says, even a dumb animal knows who his master is. But Israel, you've forgotten who I am? It's an amazing thing. See, there is such a malady called Alzheimer's. And what happens when that attacks an individual, they start, first of all, to lose their way. They start forgetting on where they are going. Then they start losing their personal history, and then they lose their life. My mother-in-law has two sisters, and the three of those ladies went to visit their mother well into her 90s, suffering from this type of malady, and they treated her with tender, loving care all day long. And at the end of the day, my mother said, I was very saddened, I was shocked, because my mother, who I had loved my whole life, who had loved me, looked at us and said, well, you're nice ladies, do you work here? She said, it's shocked to me. My own mother didn't recognize who I was. She said, it hurt me. What do you think it does to God when God looks at a nation that he's blessed so much and that nation has begun to forget him? Now, when Israel started to forget God, what he did was he tried to remind them who he was. Hold your hand right there and look with me over to Isaiah chapter 46. And verse 9, there's a lot of different places we can go with. This will suffice for our needs this evening. And it says here in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9, and I'll start reading for sake of time. Catch up if you would, please. It says, remember, this is God speaking to Israel. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. Look at this in verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. God doesn't say I declare the beginning from the end. He says, I live in eternity. You see, I know not only the beginning from the end, but the end from the beginning. I know all. He said, if you don't basically start realizing that from ancient times, I even know the things that are not yet done. He said, look, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Look at verse 11. He said, if you don't straighten up, basically, calming a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth, that, excuse me, that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. He said, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to bring chastisement upon you, because you're supposed to be my glory. Now, Old Testament, Israel was the channel of blessing to the world. In the New Testament, it's not a nation, it's the church. But the church, by the way, exists here in America in a stronger manner than anywhere on earth. Why? Because we have so much civic liberty. That's why. And we still are the epicenter for missions. This still is the land of the Bible. This still is the land of great and often repeated revivals time and time again. This is still a land predominant and the preeminence of God's Word and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. This America is something very unique, you see. And so, so many times people forget 
from whence they came. Uh, there are some young people who say, well, I don't like history. And I said, well, if you don't like history, it's because you had a bad history teacher. If he had me as history, I'll guarantee, as a history teacher, you wouldn't have uh, said that history was boring. Because when I taught history in Bible college, they put my class all the way at the end of the hall because they knew some antics were going to go on. Because I wanted to make history live. And so my college students were in there, and every time it came to the Lincoln assassination, I brought the replica of the gun that John Wilkes Booth used. Unbeknownst to my students, it was loaded with a pretty good charge of black powder. <laughs> now, I didn't have a projectile, and I didn't want to kill anyone. I didn't want it to be that realistic. But the fact is, I had a good charge of black powder, and I went through the whole scenario of how John Wilkes Booth, being an actor, knew that play that they were performing in Ford's Theater that night. Our American cousin knew when the laughter was going to occur, and that's when he opened the door so they wouldn't hear the cre creaky uh, uh, the, the hinge. And then he would wait for the next uproarious laughter. And that's when he took the step so they wouldn't hear the creaking of the wooden floor. And slowly but surely, John Booth, John Wilkes Booth, crawled up and, and crept up on Lincoln. Bang! Just like that, the gun went off. And, and thank you very much for illustrating what my students did. Amen? Because what that's what the, I mean, I shot that thing off and my whole class went up this, this high off of their seats. Because, why? Because I wanted history to live, you see. History is his story. His story. That's where we get our word from, history. And there's one thing that we learn from history, and that is, we don't learn from history. And that's stupid. Someone said, oh, Brother Harding, please don't use that word stupid. It's provocative. That's why I use it. It's a bad case of the stupids. The Germanic term is where that stupid word comes from. The etymology of the word stupid is from the Germanic stupid, meaning the runt of the litter. It's runt reasoning. It's not looking at the whole gamut. We're supposed to have a circumspect walk, knowing from whence we came, where we are, so we can proceed correctly into the future, you see. And that's something that we, as God's people, need to understand. The young people say, well, Brother Harding, you don't understand. Uh, I'm just living in the present, dude. I don't need nobody history. I'm just living right here now. And, and I say, well, you're really not. And they say, what do you mean? I said, none of us are really living in the present. What are we talking about? Because everything that we've seen, everything that we've thought, everything that we've basically heard, even in this message, is history. And what I say right there is history. And right there. And right there. I just wave, History. Because as soon as you see it, as soon as you think about it, as soon as I say it and you hear it, it slips past us in a nanosecond of time. And now you're just thinking that I clapped my hands, but I clapped my hands just a few seconds, a few milliseconds ago. You understand what I'm saying? So we are our, tums, our sum total of our personal history. If you forget your history, personally, you forget your identity. The problem with America is she's lost her way. She's losing her identity. And if we don't do something, she'll lose her national life. See, God's people need to be the conscience of the nation. God's people are the ones that can remember what this nation has been all about and then remind other people as well. We need to be this type of people. Job chapter 8 and verse 8 says, For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to search of the fathers, for we are but of yesterday. And know nothing, because our days upon earth are a shadow. Everything that right now is occurring has been determined by the past. Right now in the present, everything has been determined by the past. And how you proceed into the future, correctly or incorrectly, is how you have basically related or responded to what God has done for you in the past. Amen? That's where we get our faith from. Because what God has done, He will do. And every time that we increase in faith, what are we doing? We're remembering that God did answer this prayer. And if He answered that, maybe He'll give me a little bit more this time for this purpose or that person. And He will basically see some things occur in my life that I will continue to grow in grace. I want to ask you a question. How many in here believe that God's still a God of miracles? 
okay, if you know, if you believe that God's a God of miracles, that he'll do the same thing for us as he did for the people in the Bible, do you have a miracle on your prayer list? Huh? You see, you need to put your feet where your faith is. Do you have something on your prayer list that you're praying for? It won't get done unless God does it. Hmm? Now, I'm not saying praying for something that will be a shallowness of your soul. Not like that guy that was talking to the Lord and said, Lord, you know where he was going. Lord, what's a million dollars like to you? And the Lord says a million dollars to me is like a penny. Oh, oh Lord, what is a thousand years like to you? The Lord said, it's a thousand years to me is like a minute. He said, Lord, could I have a penny? The Lord said, wait a minute. <laughs> you think about that for a few minutes, you'll get it, okay? <laughs> Come on, work with me here, folks. <laughs> but we need to have a miracle on our prayer list that we're praying for. Hey, look, I pray for a miracle for our country. For years, God gave us one. And we have Gorsuch as Supreme Court of the United States. You say, why is that so important that Gorsuch is there? Because he is a constitutionalist and because it's biblical. Let me show you something from Isaiah chapter 1. Look to me back to Isaiah chapter 1. I told you hold your place there. And verse 26. See, God has something very interesting for us in all of these different respects of our country. He says this in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 26, And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors, the lawyers, as at the beginning. And afterward, after the judges and the lawyers have been restored, afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. So God restores the righteousness to a city, state, to a nation, through and by the judicial system. But we have forgotten so much, you see. So much of what God has done for us. Look with me, Joshua chapter 4. Are you with me tonight? Say amen. amen. Joshua chapter 4. See, memorials, God gives us memorials, you see. And, and what they do is they point to definitive areas in history. And they aid us, naturally forgetful people that we are, to remember the past truthfully from God's perspective. And that is having a biblical worldview of his story, history. In Joshua chapter 4, it talks about when Joshua told the 12 men of each tribe to pick up a big stone and put that rock on their shoulder. In chapter 4 and verse 1, it came to pass when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you 12 men of the people out of every tribe of man and command you them, saying, Take you hence, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, out of, out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. So Joshua took those twelve men. They each got a big stone. These were the linebackers of Israel, okay? And they took those stones and they piled them up on the east side of Jordan. And the reason why Joshua talks about this, it says in verse 6 that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean you by these stones? Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and this, these stones shall be for a what? A memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So he, you have a little boy walking along with his daddy. Years later, on the east side of Jordan, he sees those stones, pulls on his dad's bridges, his dad. What's that over there? And the dad looks into the eyes of his son. He says, oh, son, I wish you could have been here. The Jordan is raging past them as they are standing in the promised land. And he looks at his little boy and says, right here, when your mom and I were crossing over into the promised land, our priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of our God moved into the waters and God's power pushed the waters back. And son, we went across on dry ground right here. The little boy looks up into his dad's face and Really, Dad? He says, yes, son. Look over to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. You see, this is what we need to be doing for our young people is teaching them how special we are. Because if they don't wake up and snap out of it, they're going to lose everything. 
that they ever held precious, you see. And I, I tell you, I, it's, it's sometimes a challenge for young people, but this is exactly why, you see, God wants this to occur. Psalm 78, verse 4, And we will not hide them from their children. What? Those dark sayings of old history. Showing to the generation to come three things. Look at this, the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. Why? Look at it, that in verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. So we show the young people the praise of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works. We show the young people, if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have a nation. If it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have the type of clothes that you wear, eat the type of food that you eat, live in the type of homes that you live in, and drive the type of automobiles that you have. If it wasn't for God, you would not be in this nation enjoying the peace and prosperity that God has blessed us with. Amen. And let me just say, he can take it that quick. Well, Brother Hardy, uh, didn't we have judgment on 9-11? That was a warning. You don't want to see the judgment of God. It happens within an hour. And I'm not talking about thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands. I'm talking about millions of people if God gets involved. We don't want to see that happen. We, we want to keep on God's good side as far as our nation goes. You understand? And we, God's people, are the ones that need to be doing this. So what about all the rest of the young people? Look, we don't have responsibility for all the rest of the young people. We do have responsibility for our young people. Amen? And then we try to reach as many others as possible. That's why you have a bus ministry. Amen? I appreciate the bus ministry. That's why we do what we do in Washington, D.C. and go into these offices and pray with these people. Why? So that we can see God be continue to work and begin to work in the lives of those people that are passing the laws for us. Folks, Memorials in Washington, D.C. I, I started walking around Washington at the age of 12. And, and I know Washington like the back of my hand. And, and if you take a line and you draw it from the Capitol down to the Lincoln, from the White House over to the Jefferson, it forms a perfect cross. And in the apex of that perfect cross is the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument is 555 feet high. That's the number of God's grace, five times three. On the capstone, made out of aluminum, which was a very unique alloy at the time that the Washington Monument was built, visible only to heaven are these words etched, Laos Dio, meaning praises to God. There's a city ordinance. No other building can be built higher than the Washington Monument because when the sun rises and crests over the trees, the first thing that it hits is the capstone of the Washington Monument and illuminates it because our founding fathers wanted to remind God when he looked down the federal city of this nation, this nation was founded at least at one point for praise and honor to God. See, that's what we need to understand. That's what we need to remember. You know, folks, I, I tell you, it's strange what's going on in our country. Right after the first capital connection, we were given an office. Basically, we were offered an office right across from the Supreme Court of the United States. And it, it's a one floor of a townhouse built in the 1800s. And it's, it's very nice, has a parking place that's worth its weight in gold right there in Washington, D.C. Back room, uh, front room, uh, it has a, uh, a little bathroom with a shower and a kitchenette. And uh, you step out of our office and there's the Supreme Court, right, right there. And we've even had congressional representatives use our office for meetings already. We landed in Maine and a congressman called and said, is this Dr. Harney? I said, yes. He said, this is congressman so-and-so. I said, yeah, hey, how you doing? He said, I have a favor to ask. I said, really, you have a favor to ask? He said, yeah, I'd like to use your office. I said, hey, me casa, su casa. And I said, I'm not there, but Pastor Creed and he'll get you in. And so they, they used our office. Amazing. I, 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 st you know, I hung up and, and I looked at my wife and said, I wonder when the last time that an independent Baptist preacher was asked by a United States congressman for a favor. Amen? We now, on a weekly basis, meet with senators and congressmen every single week. We're invited now uh, to different meetings so that we can provide the, the spiritual counsel and, and the light and the soul just by being there. When they uh, asked to uh, basically, well, let me just phrase it th this way, the, f the first year after the 
first Cabell Connection, Brother Creed and I were walking down the hall, and there was a congressman. He saw us. He said, hey, you're Dr. Harding. You're Pastor Creed. You sponsored that Cabell Connection. We said, yes. He said, I need to see you in my office. I thought we were in trouble. I said, I didn't do it. Uh, Brother Creed was, I was just walking with him, and I, I did you know. And uh, we walked in. He took his coat off, came around, sat down. He said, I need to get your biblical opinion on something. That type of credibility we've received simply by pastors coming. You see, amazing what God's done. Because of a meeting that we had with the faith liaison, Chad Conley, from South Carolina. We have the most biblical platform in the history of any political party in the United States. Say, Brother Harding, someone asked me before the service began, are you Republican or you're Democrat? I said, I'm a Christocrat. I vote the Bible. And whatever party is closest to the Bible, that's where I am. The party that's for life of the unborn, that's where I am. The party that's for a traditional family, that's where I am. The party that's for the nation of Israel, that's where I am. The party that's for Second Amendment rights, that's where I am. Because all of those things are biblical, and that's where God is, and that's where I am. You know, I kind of like Second Amendment rights. Amen? Amen. I don't even think we should be licensed because it's a, it, it's, a, it's a right. Now, I lived in Oklahoma for many years, and Oklahoma, you know, they have the concealed carry, open carry, and, and it's, we have reciprocity with Texas and Missouri, Arkansas, the states that surround us, you know. And I remember a lady, sort of a lady, she was very petite, very well-dressed Christian lady. She was traveling uh, from Oklahoma to Texas. And uh, she had a concealed carry permit. And she was pulled over by a Texas state trooper. So this lady from Oklahoma got kind of nervous. Very nice Christian lady, very petite Christian lady. And instead of giving him her license, she gave him her concealed carry permit. She said, I'm sorry, officer. That's my concealed carry permit. Here's my license. And he stopped for a minute, looked at her, and here she was, this very nice lady. And, and finally he said, ma'am, do you have weapons in the car she said yes officer i have a 357 magnum in my glove box i have a 45 uh, underneath my console right here uh, i have a 22 in my purse and oh yeah i have a sawed off shotgun stuck underneath my dashboard <laughs> he said ma'am what are you afraid of she said absolutely nothing <laughs> and that's america amen <laughs> but we have forgotten so much we think that the Supreme Court is where the rules and the laws come from. We know the Supreme Court said you can no longer view the Ten Commandments in public. Here's the problem. It goes against the Constitution. That's the ultimate law of the land based upon the ultimate law of the universe, God's Bible. This isn't a perfect document, but this sure enough is. 28 biblical principles here from here. And one of the things is, and, and I think this is kind of unique, everyone's bowing down to the Supreme Court, and if they say it's law, it's the law. But that's not what the Constitution says. Now, I, I'm going to, let's see, ask a young person to help me here, okay? have some volunteers. I saw your hand up first. What's your name? John, how old are you? Come up here, John. 11 years old. Okay? Congratulations, that's double digits. Are you, are you a smart fellow, John? Okay, he's got some self-confidence too. Amen. That's good. Okay, I'm going to show everyone how intelligent you are. Okay? I'm going to help you. You ready? Okay, just remember, listen to what I say, because it's going to be really easy. Really easy. Okay, you ready? Okay. I, I just have a feeling John's a character, amen? I want you to behave yourself just for a few minutes here, okay? All right, okay. Article 1, Section 1, Constitution of the United States, highest law in the land, right? You got that? Okay. This is what it says. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested. So it means all law-giving powers, okay, are given or vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. So here's the question, John. If all law-giving powers are given to the Congress, how much is left over for the other two branches? 
None. Thank you. Give him a hand. John, 11 years old, figures out in a few seconds when the Constitution says all law-giving powers are given to the Congress, that there's none left over for the other two branches. So here's my question. Why then is the Supreme Court and the inferior, inferior and appellate courts legislating from the bench? Huh? Why are they in a judicial activist role when the Constitution says there's only one branch of the government that has any law-giving powers whatsoever? And, and look, not just this president, but many presidents before, why are they giving these executive orders that are laws? When the Constitution says that there's only one branch of government that can pass or negate laws. See, the legislative branch, they represent us, we the people, who are the government. Okay? Amen? And then the judicial branch, they interpret the laws, and the executive branch, the president, he executes the laws. But when everyone's bowing down to the Supreme Court, there goes our whole system of government. Now, there is separation of powers, and the tri-form of government is based upon the Bible. Look with me to Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 22, and I'm going to show you something else. How many still with me tonight? Say amen. amen. See, this is our country. We need to know these things because they've been forgotten. Isaiah 33 and verse 22, it says, look, look at this. For the Lord, this is where we found it. This is not a spinoff of Rome or Greece. Our nation's government is from God's word. And as James Madison said, he appealed to the governor of the universe. Look at this. For the Lord is our judge. There's the judiciary. The Lord is our lawgiver. There's the legislative branch. The Lord is our king. There's the executive branch. He will save us. How about that? Right there in the Bible. And the separation of powers is from Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, where God says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the, our founding fathers said, hey, ultimate power is going to always corrupt ultimately, you see. You know, the Supreme Court said something. They said we can no longer view the Ten Commandments in public. Remember that? And you can't have them in schools, and you can't have them in the public for. But when I step out of our office and I look at the Supreme Court, guess what's at the top of the Supreme Court building in the apex? It's Moses holding out the Ten Commandments. So I said, that's kind of strange. So I decided to take a tour. And I went on a tour, and guess where the judges sit? Nine judges, they sit here, and they look when they're in judgment at wooden doors that are closed, and guess what's carved in the wooden doors? You got it, because our founding fathers wanted them to remember they don't sit in judgment for man, they sit in judgment for God. And when you look over, if you're sitting there and watching the judges, as I've done, over to your right and their left is this huge relief, 3D marble representation of the lawgivers. And one lawgiver out basically by himself is Moses holding two tablets of stone and the Ten Commandments written in Hebrew. So we were on a tour and there were hundreds of people and the guy said, are there any questions? And he looked at me, I said, didn't the Supreme Court say we can no longer view the Ten Commandments in public? He said, that's right. I said, then what's Moses holding right there? In front of several hundred people, you know what he said? Those aren't the Ten Commandments, those are the Bill of Rights. I waited for someone to challenge him. No one did. So I raised my hand again. It was like a tennis match. They were looking at him, looking at me, looking at him, looking at me. You can answer this guy's question. Hey, he's got a question. Finally, it was like a teacher that didn't really want to call in a student because he knew what they were going to say. He said, yes. I said, I don't remember Moses being at the Constitutional Convention. And I don't remember the Bill of Rights being written in Hebrew on two tablets of stone. You know what he said? Get this now. He said, I know that's what we're supposed to say. Now, folks, we need to remember these things. I don't care if the world thinks we're crazy. They shouldn't think we're stupid. 
I remember a story of a very successful businessman, and he was going and, uh, to a business trip, uh, and, and he had to rotate his tires because they were wobbling a little bit in the front. And so they rotate his tires, and the guy at the gas station didn't put the lug nuts securely on the back passenger wheel, just finger tight. He tightened all the rest of them, but that particular wheel, just finger tight. So as he drove down the road, the vibration started wearing off the lug, nut, lug nuts, and each one literally came off and fell off, and the last one came off, fell off, and he stopped just in the nick of time. He got out of his car, walked around, and there his tire was, no lug nuts, and it's cocked like this. You can still see the bolts going through, but no nuts to put on, on the bolts. Just by chance, he had stopped in front of an insane asylum, and there was an inmate looking at him through the gate. He looked over and said, and the inmate very calmly said, well, if you take one lug nut off the last three many tires, you can get that fourth tire put on securely and drive to the next gas station and get some more lug nuts. Which, that's a great idea. What are you doing in there? He said, well, I may be crazy, but I'm not stupid. Amen? And I don't care if the world thinks we're crazy. They shouldn't think we're stupid. It's time that we wake up it's time that we get prayed up. It's time that we study up and we speak up so that our nation can continue to go forward for the gospel's sake. Amen. For our children and our children's children. Memorials in Washington, D.C. Look everywhere. It's not just to people and things. It's to God and what He's done for us. World War II Memorial. I'm glad that they have a memorial. As I was flying out, an honor flight was flying in. These 90-some-year-olds from World War II go to see their memorial. But you know what they do? When they go see FDR's address to the joint session of Congress where he's declaring war on the Axis powers, they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where are the four words? Where are the words at, at the end? We heard this on the radio. FDR was saying that America's righteous might will endure to the end, to ultimate victory. The, this type of thing will never be perpetrated upon America again. But he ended with four words. They're not there. That solidified us as a nation. So help us, God. God's nowhere to be found in World War II Memorial. You know why? Because it was built by Hollywood. Our nation is a Christian nation. And we need to remember. So, when we see these things, we realize something. Two men said the same thing back to back. One man, way over on the right ideology, George Washington, said if we lose recognition of God's hand in our culture and God's hand in our nation, if we lose the idea that we have a dependence upon Him, this nation will never last. On the other side, another man on the left-hand side of the spectrum of ideology Karl Marx said, take the ideology, take the basic heritage away from a people, and they're easily persuaded. I told you this morning, that old story about Paul Revere riding through the town, crying the British are coming, the British are coming. That didn't happen. What did happen, Brother Harding? Well, you read his own journals, what he said himself. He knew that only one-third of the American populace was on the side of the patriots. One-third were monarchists, and the last one-third were fence straddlers. Didn't really care which way it went. Of course he wasn't going to be shouting, the British are coming, because the fact of the matter is he would have been turned in and captured. He was captured and then got out. He escaped, and he rode to one man's house. To, and then started warning a few others, very clandestine, very quiet. The one man was housing two men. Those two men, the British want, wanted dead. One of them was John Hancock, one of our previous presidents that wrote his name nice and, la uh, and, and large on the declaration. Remember that? And the reason why he wrote his name nice and large because he knew that the king of England needed spectacles, needed glasses that he didn't always have with him. So when he unrolled that document, he wanted to make sure that he saw his name because he was a very wealthy man. He wanted the king to know he was on board with the rest of the boys. Second man was Samuel Adams, the originator of the first tea party that threw all the tea overboard. Amen. They wanted those two men dead. And sure enough, 
Paul Revere rode to Jonas Clark's house that was their host and walked in and said, gentlemen, the British are on the move. And most likely they're going to be coming west here to Lexington Concord to get our weapons and stores of ammunition. Then they're going to go north to Boston. And John and Sam, they're after your heads. Neither one of those men said anything. They both looked at their host. And they said this, are your people ready? He said, yes, my people are ready. He said, I've been preparing for just this day. Who was Jonas Clark? He was a pastor. Who is he talking about? Over a hundred men in his church, the Minutemen. That next morning, on that faithful day in April, the bell tower from his church rang the alarm, and those men were out on Lexington Green to face off 800 British regulars, hardened troops. And he had preached from his pulpit, don't fire first, because if the war begins... God will bless a war of defense much more than a war of offense. But if it does begin, let it begin here. And sure enough, before our men fired one shot, the British opened up. And 18 men lay dead and dying on Lexington Green, all members of a pastor's church. Don't tell me Christians didn't have a critical role in this nation Many times, time after time, a pastor would lead his congregation into battle as a regiment. Those men, one, one was uh, John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, and he was preaching in a black robe and pulled the black robe back at the end of his message, referring to the book of Ecclesiastes and saying, there is a season for everything under heaven. There is a time for peace, and there is a time for war, and this is a time for war. And I won't preach from this pulpit again until the tyranny of King George III is taken off from us because I won't be able to preach in freedom much longer pulled that black robe back and exposed the officer's uniform in the Continental Army. He said, how many of you men will join me in this battle for freedom and against tyranny? And 160 men immediately in his congregation started to turn to their wives and kiss their wives goodbye and hug their children and marched out. Next day, over 300 men joined him to form an 8th Regiment of Pennsylvania. And he was one of 16 men that became a major general. His brother was a pastor up in New York. His brother, Frederick Muhlenberg, chided him, wrote him a letter, said you shouldn't be escaping and, and just leaving your sheep, your shepherd. You should be shepherding your sheep. He wrote his brother back. He said, I remember another shepherd who left his flock for a while because there was an uncircumcised Philistine defying the armies of the living God. His name was David. And that man, that enemy, his name was Goliath. Amen. You've heard this story, right? And where he takes that rock and, and slings it and it hits that Goliath. And you know the last thing that Goliath says as he's falling on the ground? Nothing like that has ever entered my mind before. Amen. <laughs> what I'm saying is, folks, we need to be people that remember our history to start studying our history. That's why I have those books out there. They're a compilation of all of these types of stories that we need to learn to teach to our children so that they know the strength, the power, the glory of our God. So how the people of Israel do as I close? Turn to Judges chapter 2 and I'll show you. Because if we don't do something very soon, you see, we're going to be in the same state of affairs. Judges chapter 2 and verse 7 I'll start for sake of time. You catch up to the people, it says, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Look to verse 10 for sake of time. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. And also, all that generation were gathered unto the fathers. What generation? The ones that saw God do these things. And look at this now, and there arose another generation after them. Look at this, which knew not the Lord, the whole head sick. Ah, uh, there it is. Nor yet the works which he had done for Israel, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served to Balaam, and they forsook, oh, the whole heart faint. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. And look at the third step down and followed other gods, the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. 
and the, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. You say, Brother Harding, why do you have this kind of ministry? Because I don't want to see America on the auction block. That's why. I want to see our country remain free. Look with me as just a couple more verses and I'm done. Are you still with me tonight? Amen. Isaiah chapter 1. Because God gives us something here. You, you understand, right, that currently North Vietnam is trying to get a nuclear device put together. You understand there's such a thing as, as the electromagnetic pulse bomb. And, and if they explode one about 300 miles above the United States, all of our electrical grids will go down. If they all go down together, we're not going to get anything started back up electrically for six months to a year. Did you see Katrina when it hit the southern coastal states? How that affected society? While the rest of our country was rushing to their aid? Can you imagine our whole country going down? No electricity. No running water. No food. No vehicle running. That means trucks bringing the food to the stores. Have you ever seen stores empty out? How quickly they empty out in a catastrophe? And do you realize that Mr. Mueller, and I'm not trying to scare anybody. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But we need to know these things. Mr. Mueller, who was one of the former directors of the FBI, he says no longer if, it's when we're attacked and to what extent. Now that's the director of the FBI. Now folks, I hope that never happens. He said, well, why hasn't that happened yet, Brother Harding? Why haven't we had a, a national catastrophe? I, I'm going to show you right, right now why. It says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 9, and I know there, there's one interpretation to every scripture, but there's several applications. So with your permission, I'm going to make an application here. It says, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us, look at this, a very small remnant. Now, you ladies would know what a remnant is. And God could have said remnant. But he didn't just say remnant. He didn't just say small remnant. He said a very small remnant. Except the Lord had allowed us to keep that very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. You know why God hasn't judged this nation yet? I'm looking at some of the reasons why. Because of you being here, following your pastor's leadership. You know, you know God honors your presence here in church. Yeah. You understand that? And the prayer meetings that you've had for our country, you know God's heard those. You understand that, right? And just your being here tonight, that very small remnant. You say, Brother Harney, what are you talking about? I, I'm talking about the fact that, look with me to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. You see, I know America will falter one day. I know that God will bring judgment upon this country one day. If he doesn't, he'll have to apologize to all the rest of the nations down through history. I just don't want to see it on our watch. Do you? I don't want to see it for our children and our grandchildren. I would like to see it postponed and to see the prolonging of our nation until the rapture comes. Amen. Amen? It says in Proverbs 28 and verse 2, For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof. That means a lot of people have messed up this country. But look at this now. But that sends us in a 180 degrees the other direction by a man of understanding and knowledge. Look at this. The state thereof shall, that's a promise, be prolonged. Say, Brother Harding, then, if you know America is going to be judged, what are you doing? I'm trying to prolong the state of this nation. Amen. Amen? Don't you think that's worthwhile to do? Well, I was told by a fellow in Missouri, Brother Harding, when God decides he's going to judge a nation, he's going to judge a nation. That's true. But in God's never-changing character is the ever-presence of mercy. He's waiting to give mercy. And it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You tell me another nation that's more merciful than America. We are the first one on the ground in any type of national catastrophe. Originators, developers of the Red Cross. And we give and we give and we give of our substance. You know why? Because we are beneficent because we serve a God that's beneficent. And so because of that, I think we are in the good state of prayer to ask God for mercy. Every single day, I ask God, Lord, 
have mercy on us. For three country curses that he's destroyed nations down through history over. Number one, the killing of the unborn. I ask God not to forgive us, but to have mercy on us. I ask him, number two, because we, through the Supreme Court, and not knowing that we could basically hobble them, that we allowed the Supreme Court to say that it is constitutional for same-sex marriage, same-gender marriage, I pray that God has mercy on us for that. Number three, I pray that God would have mercy on us because for the last eight years, we've been very unfriendly to Israel. So I've been asking God to have mercy on us every single day for years now. Why? Well, someone said, when God decides he's going to destroy a nation. True. I said, but look at the wicked Gentile nation of Nineveh that was under a 40-day judgment call. 40 days. And an unwilling, partially digested <laughs> preacher showed up. Yeah. No wonder they paid attention to him. You could smell him before you saw him. <laughs> the Bible says that the great fish, the whale, vomited him up. And he hit the ground, running and sliding probably a little bit. Amen. He was highly motivated. Made a three-day journey in one day. Spoke an eight-word message. And Nineveh repented. And God repented of the evil and postponed his judgment. Now, Nineveh still fell. But Nineveh fell, many believe, over 125 years later. God postponed, prolonged the state of that nation. See, I'd like to see that happen with America. As we close tonight, I want to have all the young people, teenagers, on down to stand up. And don't wake any of the young people if, if they're asleep. But teenagers, young people, and, and anyone that's below teenage, stand up. Just for a minute. Just, just stand up for a minute. Everyone stand All the young people stand up. Okay? Teenagers and below. Okay? What's your name? And how old are you? 14. What's your name, buddy? And how old are you? Nine. And what's your name? Adrian. And how old are you, Adrian? 24. Okay. And, and what's your name? Dalton. Dalton, how old are you? 19. Hey, good special tonight. 19. You're not a teenager? Or are you 20? <laughs> She's here. I'm 20. <laughs> I'm 20. Okay. How old are you, Brittany? How old? Super 14. Amen. You young ladies, what's your name? Madeline, how old are you? Eleven. And you? How old are you? Twelve. You had to think about it for a minute. She went fifteen, twelve. No, twelve. twelve. How old are you? Thirteen. And you, buddy? How old are you? Nineteen? How about you? Where'd you get that red hair, Anthony? Him? <laughs> that guy? How old are you? Amen. And what's your name, young lady? And how old are you? <laughs> what's your name buddy how old are you nine and how, how about you Emily how are you seven now that's God's perfect number does that mean you're perfect no <laughs> and what's your name young lady and how old are you eight I could go around and continue to be you, see, you know these are the young people in your church I, I, I'm, I'm going to hand out some. We handed out something at the beginning called Five Minutes for America. Thank you, young people. You, you can be seated. Five Minutes for America. <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you prayed for an hour for our country? Just our country. For an hour. We sing that song, Sweet Out of Prayer? Let me ask you this. When was the last time you prayed for a half an hour for just our country? I'll make it real easy. When's the last time that you by yourself prayed for 15 minutes, just 15 minutes for our country? Okay, we're, we're going to get to where we're going. When was the last time you prayed for five minutes just for our country? Have you ever prayed for one thing for five minutes? It's a long time for one thing. Now, folks, the problem with America is Christians aren't praying the way that we should. You know, all failure 
in the Christian life is prayer failure. You understand that? I think these young people are worth five minutes of my day. We sit there and sometimes watch television for hours. Five minutes. These young people are worth five minutes, aren't they? We live 24-hour days. That pamphlet I handed out, that's not going to be worth anything unless there's a commitment behind that pamphlet. I told God over a decade ago, there'll never be another day in my life before I put my head on my pillow at night, Lord, that I won't pray for certain things every day for my country and every day by God's grace. Now, I just believe this. I believe these precious young people are worth five minutes of anyone's day for our country so we can go forward so these young people can one day grow up and see what God's wanted them to do come to fruition in their life, no matter what that is. But I'm telling you, folks, we're in some major, major trouble today where we have trillions of dollars of debt that we've been saddled with. But see, God's a God of miracles. And he can do anything if we start getting serious about our prayer life. Oh, I'll pray for you, brother. Man, that's an abused term. If I tell you I'm going to pray for you, I put your name on my prayer list, and I pray for you every day. Wendy, I'm going to start praying for you every day. Everyone raise your hand and pray for Wendy. I, I'll guarantee you, I will be praying for you by name every day. I'll be praying for your pastor every single day. I'll be praying for this church every single day. I pray for our country every day. And I can't even begin to tell you what God's done for me in my life since I've gotten really serious about prayer. And the miracles that I've seen God do simply by being serious about prayer. Every one of these young people need our commitment because we will pray in one of two ways. Either we'll get to this old-fashioned altar tonight and say, by God's grace, there'll never be another day in my life before I put my head on my pillow that I won't give you five minutes and use that pamphlet. And there's some more out there and you can take others with you when you go. By your grace, God, not another day in my life, five minutes. I promise you, by thy grace... I will give you five minutes. We'll pray out of determination or I'll guarantee you we'll be praying out of desperation. I don't want to pray out of desperation once we've lost everything. So I just want to ask you tonight, what would you rather? Determination now or desperation later when it's too late? For our faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ our family, our freedom, even our fellow citizens that are waiting out there for someone to get to them to tell them about the good news of Jesus.